from my own experience as an engineer myself, I think that sometimes I don't think we understand and hold ourselves accountable for the impact that our solution, what we're engineering actually has a consequence in the real world. I think we're so filled with this beautiful need to engineer and to to create solutions and just do stuff, which is beautiful because we're just like, oh, let's just solve this problem. But we don't actually understand and hold ourselves accountable and be like, oh, this is not just a solution I'm doing for my class or something I'm doing in my free time. As soon as I put it out into the world, it has consequences. It has impact. And if we don't hold these accountable and stop just looking at ourselves as just, oh, I'm just engineering. No, you're engineering a solution that is used by real humans. And you need to hold those ethical consideration into question because if we don't start as engineers considering what ethical decision needs to be put into our solutions then it's like as if we're divorcing that part of the role it's like oh i will just do the solution and you're gonna think about it but as i said before transparency has to happen from the first stage and i think as I can also see in my own community, I don't think that they thought about the biases because you were just maybe having so much fun designing and like, oh, wow, we created this super amazing tool. Let's put it out there so people can try it. But I think this almost innocent and naive way of doing it shows also how young technology is as a field when you look at it. It's, I think we're just so excited to release stuff, but we don't, it's as if, everyone started making cars in their garages and like, oh, look, I made a car and then just released it without thinking about airbags or seat belts. It's almost as naive as that, right? It's like we, there are considerations to be made when you release something into the real world that can, anyone can use. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the d Data Channel podcast. I'm your host, Deepak. And with me, we have Ms. Nermeen Konyu. Nermeen applies her unique blend of technology, ethics, and uh, design skill sets in her passion and passion. And she leads many initiatives such as Alohera and With Purpose. She's a firm believer in transparent AI systems and a strong advocate for building AI in the most ethical way possible. Her LinkedIn posts always reflect this and she strives for this change. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today, Nermeen, and uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. Thank you for inviting me. So I have a couple of questions for you today and uh, starting with this one. So what are the major ethical concerns AI is posing with its uh, new language models? I'd say that the main risk area is the unintentional societal bias embedded within large language models. Um, These include issues of bias, fairness, and representation. Um, If we take the example of gender bias, for example, this comes into play in the form of algorithmic bias, for example. So in other words, coded bias in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Popular examples include Amazon's hiring software and Apple Card's selection of people for loans that would prioritize male applicants over female applicants. Um, But it also comes in the form of data bias, such as missing or mislabeled data sets. Uh, One good example of that is Google's quick draw experiment. Uh, When you only use images of sneakers and similar to train your machine learning algorithm for recognizing shoes, then gender bias unintentionally sneaks itself into the machine learning model. This is what happened with Google's quick draw experiment when it was first launched. It would simply not accept the drawing of a high heel for the prompt shoes. This is why it's crucial to get input from a diverse group of people early on. And then we also have other gender blind tech that simply isn't incorporating the voice of women and girls. The list is endless here. Examples include lack of female representation when designing bots and uh, um, car crash dummies, for example. Uh, These can also create unfair discrimination as well as representational and material harm by promoting stereotypes and harmful associations of specific traits for certain social identities. Right, right. So like out of the examples which you mentioned, like what are some of the worst AI biased outputs you have seen and like how can they be mitigated? So there are plenty of examples in real life where these algorithms, if we do not properly or cautiously address these bias issues, can, for instance, put women's life in danger. Um, in medical science, medicine is being tested on men dominantly, uh, but then are recommended for all patients, regardless of their gender or where you're from. So sometimes you don't work for women, and especially women of color. 
uh, actually there's a really great book invisible woman by carolyn criado paris that unearths this dangerous pattern in data and its consequences on women's lives for example a popular example is the uh, seat belts uh, you were designed for the average male body uh, driver's seats too were designed with the male body in mind and fail to take into account the fact that women tend to sit closer to the steering wheel. So because of gender bias data, women were 17% more likely to be killed in an auto accident and 73% more likely to be seriously injured than men until very recently. This is why the it wasn't me or this is not my problem approach in response to biased AI just doesn't cut it anymore. As Caroline says herself, this is a case of justice and this is a case of saving lives. And there's just not acceptable argument against addressing this. Right, right. So uh, what are the various levels of transparency that each model should ideally achieve before going into a major production or a release? So AI models are highly complex systems. Um, they're designed, developed, and deployed in complex environments by many different stakeholders. This means that there's a lot of room for error and misuse. So contrary to some beliefs, transparency is not something that can or should happen at the end of deploying a model when someone asks about it. Uh, we need to ensure a transparent communication from the designers to developers to the executives who approve the release to the people and impacts, as well as everyone in between. Um, so we need to make more transparent why an AI solution was chosen, how it was designed and developed, on what grounds it was released to production, as well as how it's being monitored and updated and the conditions under which it may be retired. So for instance, I recently read about the case of an AI designed to read x-rays in search of cancerous tumors. And because of a communication breakdown, the data science had set a low tolerance for false negatives and in return, a high tolerance for false positives to be on the really safe side. Um, in simpler words, the AI was overly sensitive. But the lack of transparency in this design decision meant that radio radiologists, the end users, spent more time analyzing 40 AI flagged X-rays they did for instead of the 100 non-flagged X-rays they usually do. So because the radiologist thought the AI must have seen something you were missing, so they just kept looking. So here AI uh, could have been benefited from a more transparent design process. Right, right. So do you believe there should be a screening at every stage in the AI development process uh, to mitigate these type of bias and like how complicated uh, like this process would be like as per your understanding? I would not say every stage of AI development. Um, that would be too process heavy. Uh, but we should definitely implement a so sort of audit and a learning module at the end or midpoint, as well as before um, any AI rollout. As I think a set of such practices is pretty critical also, as I mentioned before, we need to make more transparent how these analyses are being done and how to interpret some of these outcomes and decisions for every stakeholder at every stage of the product development process. Uh, relatedly, it may make sense to be even more transparent in some circumstances because of severe risk. High risk applications of AI, for example, in medicine may require going above and beyond standard levels of transparency. Right, right. So uh, in this regard, like why diversity in AI is so important, actually? So I think diversity in AI is important because it's a field where biases, regardless of how neutral you try to be, make themselves all the way into the final product. And currently, it's, must, it's mostly one specific demographic feeding it. Therefore, the interpretation of data is likely to be subtly androcentric. And when this androcentric data is then applied to the real world, to how these algorithms are going to look at women, people of color, or other data minorities, that is when our progress in it is inhibited by making our existence and concerns virtually invisible. This is why we need diversity in the field of technology. And to create a more accurate world of AI, we need to recruit and promote more diverse talent in the AI research community. And we also need more parents and schools to expose the kids to technology and coding so more kids consider AI as a career option. And that's critical because AI has tremendous potential for good as well, which we absolutely must harness. And before anyone goes to their comment section, yes, these bias challenges are hard to solve and I don't have the solution right now, but I'm confident that someone will have, whether it's someone in my generation or the next ones. And maybe to finish it off on a hopeful note, I like to remind everyone that the Golden Gate Bridge, a bridge that's here in San Francisco, was called the impossible bridge for, for a decade by engineers. 
And funnily enough, the impossible bridge was not so impossible to build after all. It just required a lot of planning and the right heads on the problem. So uh, do you believe that these kind of characteristics uh, have a negative impact on the way we think and shaping our perceptions? I definitely, I'd say that, you. I, I think both of us grew up with technology um, at a certain age. Um, technology definitely affects how we perceive the world, how we perceive other people. I think our first access to people outside of our little circle, a little bubble is through technology. The globalization of technology allows us to see anyone, everyone online, which is beautiful, but it also portrays how these people are online. And if we portray the woman to be something specific, so someone that stays at home or someone that is mainly recognized by how sexualized her body is, then that is how you're going to perceive the woman because that is what technology is telling you. And if that is your first interaction with women or outside of your little bubble, that is how you're going to define them. And I think it's super important also for kids because growing up, the way that they define their future and their goals and their opportunities is through their parents. And then next up is social media technology, right? They look a lot towards technology to define their social identity, how their place is in society. And if that is telling them, hey, you're a girl, you cannot be an astronaut or you're a girl, you cannot be an engineer. That is what you're going to start believing because, oh, I, for example, one of the examples was the the image recognition kind of came with labels of like uh, based on pictures and if you were a lipstick then you were a fashion model and a lot of people in the comments were saying oh what's the problem that's super nice that she's being called beautiful and that's not the problem it's not that she is considered so beautiful that she could be a fashion model it's the fit the fact that there is much more that a woman can do other than being pretty other than serving physical needs of the society. I think if we don't start realizing that certain groups can be much more than what you first perceive them as back in the traditional age, then we're limiting our progress, right? Um, so, so regarding the Google's inclusive warning feature, uh, which you uh, mentioned in your LinkedIn post, actually. So what potential stereotypes did you notice in this uh, feature from Google? Um, so what I noticed in this um, feature by Google, which was basically an AI powered inclusive warnings feature to suggest edits in Google Docs, it seems like a really good idea, but it falls into the same bias traps that it was trying to prevent. Uh, for instance, um, the new Google feature suggested changing President John F. Kennedy's inaugural address to say for all humankind instead of for all mankind, which is very tone deaf when you think about it, because that's not the actual problem in gender bias. It's not human versus man. Um, and trying to insert that sensitivity into people's writing using AI um, shows that we still have a long way to go because this is not the actual problem. And Google's response to making it more inclusive by changing certain words just showed that you hadn't fully understood the problem. And you just try to ban aid it by saying, oh, we really care. That's why we don't want to say man. And instead we say human, which is not at all the problem. Um, the problem is that it's impacting our opportunities or access to jobs or access to medicine or access to car safety. All of these implications is where it matters. You using a specific word is not going to make me feel more inclusive or I'm feeling like I'm more hurt. Um, so it showed a lack of understanding in terms of understanding where the actual root problem is from. So one of the interesting use case which you mentioned uh, regarding stable diffusion model. So this model is very famous right now. And uh, like I have personally tested uh, some of the use cases which you mentioned in the post uh, regarding the bias shown by these kind of models towards women actually like uh, like I, I, I've tested this and the results are very worst as you explained, actually. So uh, do you believe that like uh, these kind of models, like when, when it's developed, there is not even a single bias check that has been performed uh, while, while training? I would love to believe that some bias check is being performed. Um, but I think that 
from my own experience as an engineer myself, I think that sometimes I don't think we understand and hold ourselves accountable for the impact that our solution, what we're engineering actually has a consequence in the real world. I think we're so filled with this beautiful need to engineer and to to create solutions and just do stuff, which is beautiful because we're just like, oh, let's just solve this problem. But we don't actually understand and hold ourselves accountable and be like, oh, this is not just a solution I'm doing for my class or something I'm doing in my free time. As soon as I put it out into the world, it has consequences. It has impact. And if we don't hold these accountable and stop just looking at ourselves as just, oh, I'm just engineering. No, you're engineering a solution that is used by real humans. And you need to hold those ethical consideration into question, because if we don't start as engineers considering what ethical decision needs to be put into our solutions, then it's like as if we're divorcing that part of the role. It's like, oh, I will just do the solution and you're going to think about it. But as I said before, transparency has to happen from the first stage. And I think, as I can also see in my own community, I don't think that they thought about the biases because you were just maybe having so much fun designing and like, oh, wow, we created this super amazing tool. Let's put it out there so people can try it. But I think this almost innocent and naive way of doing it shows also how young technology is as a field when you look at it is I think we're just so excited to release stuff, but we don't, it's as if everyone started making cars in their garages and like, Oh, look, I made a car and then just released it without thinking about airbags or seat belts. It's almost as naive as that, right? It's like, we there are considerations to be made when you release something into the real world that can, anyone can use. That's, that's really, Pretty valid, actually. So regarding one of the use cases which you highlighted uh, regarding Amazon's hiring algorithm, so so why do you believe like uh, it's it's always directed towards uh, women? I don't believe it is directed against women, and I think um, it's it's simple. And you've admitted themselves to to certain points. It's just that if you look traditionally. Um, even though um, technology was a field that initially was started by women, I think at some point there was a shift and it became uh, a lot more male dominated and stigmatized by male traits. And obviously the the resumes and the CVs that were in the database about who was working in technology are going to be male resumes and their way of setting up. If you look at the trend and patterns, obviously there's going to be a bias of the hiring software to pick male applicants because statistically speaking, the data has always had male applicants before. And if we don't consider, hey, the world is changing more, we need more women in engineering and we just train it based on what we already have, like 10 years worth of historical data that has mainly men in it, then it purposely took out every candidate that had anything related to women, like going to a women's school or being in a women's club anything related to that, anything related to being a female was purposely taken out because the hiring software was built on a data set that was biased. Um, And no, it was not anyone, I think, purposely trying to do that. I don't think anyone purposely and intentionally wanted to leave women out. At least that's what I hope for. But they failed to understand that a data set that obviously is filled with male applicants is obviously going to favor a male applicant in the future. So regarding the future AI development, so what should be the strategic direction for developing AI in a responsible and ethical manner? So I'd say there's probably three bucket of things that are pretty must do's um, in terms of uh, your question. I think the first bucket is related to the mindset and attitude engineers should have when engaging and developing AI. As I kind of um, teased before, I think we need to hold ourselves a little bit more accountable. And what I mean here is I'd like to please ask engineers, including myself, to acknowledge that, yes, we have biases and that how these algorithms are going to look at any group of people and their role in society It mainly comes from the creators, which is us. Um, and as James Zhu, an assistant professor of biomedical data science at Stanford University said, 
we need to think of machine learning as a newborn baby that has been given millions of books to read without being taught the alphabet or knowing any words of grammar. So um, the point here is AI cannot be naturally fair or, for example, gender neutral. And engineers should not think of these issues as something that is not their problem or not something that's part of our role. Um, so associated with that, I actually encourage more fact-based conversations about how this works. I think the more people talking about it and address these issues, the better. Um, and we need to also empower and educate more people to reveal and make more transparent how these analyses are done and how we interpret it. Because the more conversations we try, like it's a little bit like engineers um, talking to a duck when you're figuring out a problem. No one really does it, but you can talk to a robot doc and oh, what is the problem? You say it out loud. Sometimes doing the same thing in relation to AI and how you implement it could actually help me. Oh, I made a biased decision here. Maybe I need to reevaluate it. I think the more you talk about it, the more you can hear what is um, maybe a biased decision or not. I think the second bucket for, for these biased outputs is introducing maybe a set of good practices that we can implement along the whole AI application value chain. So at every stage of the product development process, there is a chance that bias may unintentionally sneak into the machine learning model. So for example, right from when you think about training the AI on a data set, we should have a clear set of commonly agreed upon or well-developed metrics around what a good data sheet looks like and what questions to ask when you're thinking about the quality of the data. Um, and then finally, for the last bucket, um, if we take it back to the school bench, as more people are getting into AI and data science, I think it's equally important to raise their awareness and ability to think about these ethical issues associated with them. I think it should be a mandatory and core and valued part of the curriculum, not just a check the box. So engineers don't see it as something that's just nice to do. And that's what I'm experiencing right now. People don't actually understand how critical and life critical sometimes it is to consider ethics. So um, to summarize it, I think AI governance overall needs to become a high priority. Right, right. So uh, could you talk a little bit about your company and the work you do there for the kids and the initiatives which you are actually doing right now? Yes, of course. Um, so right now I'm working at Hello Ada, which is uh, a platform um, that is targeted parents and parent-like figures and the goal is to get more kids um, into technology. There's a lot of cool initiative and resources out there that are trying to work with that mission. But as a parent, it's a little bit hard to navigate all of these beautiful and awesome resources. So we wanna make it easier to find like a one-stop destination to find all the resources based on the kid's age, uh, where they're based in the world, and also um, what you're interested in. Are you more extroverted and want to be in a workshop? Did you just want to kind of have a book and read it at home? All of these small decisions to make it as easy as, uh, as possible for a parent to actually educate their kids about coding and technology from a very young age. I think coding should be a uh, must uh, have language after English maybe uh, nowadays because it it, the world is getting more technological. I think everyone should be coding and or at least know about coding. It, I think it's it's critical that we don't leave anyone out of it, especially the future generations. And I think uh, part of the Hello Ada uh, program will also be to engage more parents to actually understand what STEM is, because right now statistics show that uh, parents that are not in STEM jobs obviously don't promote STEM jobs for their kids because they don't feel like they understand well enough how STEM works. Um, so if a parent knows a little bit more, it's easier for them to actually talk to their kids about, hey, there's opportunities in artificial intelligence, you should look into it and explain what it is instead of hyping it up and making it sound like we're building robots that are going to replace everything in the world, which is not what we're doing right now. So regarding your uh, aspirations in this field, so what do you seek and what are the expectations you have in this uh, rising tech field? I'm not sure I completely understand it, but um, at least I hope for technology um, in the next few years, I can see it already like happening right now that people are much more involved in ethics. And I think starting to realize that ethics and technology kind of go hand in hand. It's not something separate. And um, also the importance of getting as many people to understand actually what's happening in technology. I think for a very long time, technology was reserved for the elite. Um, it was kind of like a black box and people just 
understood what came out of technology, but not necessarily what was happening in technology. Nowadays, you can see a lot of people have a computer, an iPad, but you don't exactly understand how software works inside of it. It's just more of like, oh, we have this amazing tool that does a lot of cool stuff for me. But we need to actually under make them understand that there's coding, there's software, there's multiple entities that are working to make these tools as user friendly for you. And the more we get people to engage and talk about this and understand what implication all of these small design decisions have on your life, whether it's making your social media as engaging as possible, which also implies that it might be too addictive and you're spending more screen time on it, which is a design decision that you need to be made aware of so that you can decide if that's something you want to have as part of your uh, technology or is it something that you don't want. And now with everything being even more personalizable, customizable, it is even more important that people engage in technology, understand what it is so that you can make the decision that works the best for them. So um, yeah, on one hand, I hope that more people understand the technology and ethics go together. And I can see that it's kind of becoming more and more of a discussion. Sadly, not enough people are talking about it. And the second thing is that I hope that more people understand that technology is not this black box con concept that some people in Silicon Valley, quotation mark, are um, solving for us. It's something that is part of your everyday life from youth having your alarm on your smartphone to Google Maps, all of these things are impacting your real daily life. And if you don't involve yourself in technology and start talking about what you want for technology, then you will not be part of the development of the future.